and verse 45, Luke 24, verse 45, the Bible reads, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. The title for the sermon this morning is Understand the Scriptures. Now one thing I just want you to notice there from that verse, it's that that's a reference to Jesus Christ. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. You see, in order for you to be able to understand the Scriptures, it must be an act of God. Okay? The natural man cannot receive the, the Scriptures. The natural man cannot understand the Scriptures. You must be born again. You must be a saved person with the Spirit of God indwelling in you. And it is only through God and His leading that you can actually open up the Word of God and understand it. Okay? So let's uh, start with verse number 1 there, Luke 24, verse 1. So obviously we know that Luke 23 was the crucifixion of Christ. His body was taken. It was buried. Okay, and as you know, it was buried for three days and three nights. And here we are at verse number one. Now, upon the first day of the week, this being Sunday, of course, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. So these ladies, they come into the grave, they come into this sepulchre to, to anoint the body of Christ, to honor it, to prevent the, the, the bad smells of a dead body there as well. They come to this sepulchre expecting to see the dead body of Christ. But as they approach there, they see that the stone has been rolled away from the sepulchre. And then verse number 3, And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Now later on in this chapter, it's going to tell us that, is, that they're angels. That these two men in shining garments are actually angels. In verse number 5, And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? And I love those words. I love that question that gets asked by these angels. You know, why seek ye the living among the dead? You said, the, the first thing I want you to understand about the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, we understand that He rose again from the dead, Okay, but the Lord Jesus Christ, He is our God. Okay, He is our Creator. And the beautiful thing about Christianity is that we worship a God that's living. Okay, not only do we, you know, yes, He died, yes, He was buried for those three days and three nights, but the God that we serve is a living God. Hey, He's a God that we can go to and, and, and seek His face. We can pray to our Lord God. We can have that beautiful fellowship, walk in His footsteps as we sung in that hymn. Because He's our living God, a living Savior. Hey, He's not some false God. He's not some dead statue, a statue that does not have, have life. No, we serve a risen Savior. We serve the Lord God. Verse number 6. He is not here, but He's risen. Remember how He spake unto you when He was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And the third day rise again now it's interesting that these angels have to remind these ladies you know remember how he spoke to you in galilee now if you take your bibles keep your finger there in luke 24 keep your finger there in luke 24 and uh turn to uh let's see i'll get you to turn to romans chapter 6 turn to romans chapter 6 because the resurrection of christ is, is another passage where we can see the power of the Trinity at work. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. The Bible says, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Hey, according to Romans 6, 4, who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead? It said there the Father, right? By the glory of the Father. Now go across two chapters across there in Romans chapter 8, please. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. It says here, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Hey, which Spirit dwelleth in you? 
the Holy Spirit, isn't it? And it said there in Romans 8.11, but if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead, you see, it's the Holy Spirit that also contributed to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? And uh, you guys can go back to uh, Luke chapter 24 now, but I'm going to read to you from John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. You see, when Jesus Christ spoke about the, the temple, he was speaking about the temple of his body, and he said that in three days he, I, he said, I will raise it up. And so we see that even Jesus Christ resurrected himself from the dead. And this is the teaching of the Trinity. You see, there is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and yet they are the one God. It is the one true God that we worship. And all three persons of the Trinity were involved there in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. Go to Luke 24, verse 8, please. Luke 24, verse 8. Luke 24, verse 8. And they remembered his words. Okay. Now, it's really interesting because if you've been going through the book of Luke, we've seen multiple times that Jesus Christ just flatly tells them, hey, I'm going to perish, I'm going to die, I'm going to be raised again in three days. And not only these women, but we see even the disciples of Christ, they forgot these things. And they had to be brought into remembrance, these words that were spoken. Now, if you can, again, sorry, go back to Luke 9. Go to Luke 9. Luke 9. Let's remember these words of Jesus Christ. When did he say these things? Luke 9.42. Luke 9.42. And uh, if, if you recall back in Luke 24, the, 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 the angels said, hey, that's that, remember what Christ said to you in Galilee. Now, if you go to Luke 9.42, this is a time when they were in Galilee. And it says here, Luke 9.42. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered everyone at all these things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Okay. Now if that's not super clear to you that that's the reference that the angels spoke about, I'll just quickly read to you from the parallel passage here in Matthew 17, verse 18. It says, And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. I'll just drop down to verse 22. It says, And while they abode in Galilee... So Matthew gives us where they were. They were abiding in Galilee. Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. That's what we saw there in Luke chapter 9. But then he said, And they shall kill him... And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceedingly sorrow. Uh, sorry. They were exceeding sorry. Okay. So there we have the teaching of Christ in Galilee. Just flatly telling them that he will be killed and raised again on the third day. You guys are still there in Luke 9, I hope. Yeah. Go to Luke 9.22. Go to Luke 9.22. It's a bit of a Bible study this morning. Luke 9.22. Jesus Christ, even before this, says saying the son of man must suffer many things but be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day hey even in luke chapter 9 twice he teaches them that he will be slain and, and raised again the third day please go to luke 13 now just a few chapters across luke 13 verse 32 luke 13 verse 32 and he said unto them go ye and tell that fox Behold, I cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Now, if you remember the teaching through Luke 13, this was a cryptic way of Jesus Christ saying that he will be perfected, that his, his work would be completed on the third day, speaking cryptically of his resurrection from the dead. Now, go to Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 32. Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 32. He says, For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted upon. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. It's interesting. And they understood none of these things, the disciples. 
I mean, Jesus Christ just time and time again tells them, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again from the dead. But he went over the heads of the disciples. They couldn't understand this. And what, 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 the point that I want to bring forward today is not just the Bible study and to show how many times Christ showed them these things. But remember, the angels are telling these ladies, don't you remember? Jesus Christ told you. Why seek you to live in amongst the dead? What are you doing here? You know, Christ is risen. And then, he, and then it says they remembered his words. Okay. Now, what I want you to take away from this, guys, is that repetition is important. Repetition. Being, uh, things being brought back into your memory is important. You see, there's going to come times when you come to church and you listen to the preacher and, and you hear a sermon, you hear a doctrine, and, and you, the flesh is going to say to you, this is boring. Do I need to hear this once again? I, I, I already know that I need to walk in the Spirit. I, I already know I need to read my Bible. I already know I need to attend church. I already know I, I ought to pray. But you see, even a simple concept as Christ dying and being raised from the dead, you'd think that catch your attention, right? But even, the, even that teaching had to be reminded to his disciples. Okay, and when this took place, you know, oh yeah, of course, Jesus Christ taught us these things uh, many, many times. Repetition is so important. And, and the reason for this, guys, is that we often forget. We often forget. I mean, th there have been times, and I've gone back and listened to some of my preaching, and I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And it, you know, I'm the one that sat there preparing the sermon. I'm the one that sat, you know, stood there preaching the sermon. And sometimes I go back and I'm just like, oh yeah, I, I forgot that. I forgot that I, I mentioned that. I forgot that's what that verse was about. You know, uh, we, we just naturally forget. Another reason why we need repetition, guys, is that sometimes, you know, the, the principle that is being taught, the, the application that's being taught, may not be relevant to you at this point in your life. You know, you, you may have heard preaching on marriage, for example, and been a, been a single person. I'm sure there were things you learned, there were things that you picked up on, but it's not till you get married that then all those other things start to make a lot more sense and becomes a lot more relevant to you. So, you know, we're all at different stages in life. We're all at different stages in our spiritual walk. You know, and, and uh, you know, we might come to a time when many of you guys are, are mature in the Lord, but then we have new people come to the church. They're babes in Christ. They're, they're newly saved and they don't know much about the scriptures. Hey, these babes in Christ also need the opportunity to hear those doctrines from the beginning. Okay, so uh, repetition is important. And I'm going to read to you, uh, if you guys, let's see, where can I take you, make you guys go to? Go to Psalm 62. But again, keep your finger there in, in Luke 24. But go to Psalm 62. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 4.17. 1 Corinthians 4.17. And uh, you guys remember the Corinthian church. We've studied the Corinthian church and we remember just how bad they were, right? Just how bad they were as a church. But 1 Corinthians 4.17 says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. Now look at this. Who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. You see, even Paul had taught the Corinthian church, and he teaches the same thing to every church, he says, but he was going to send Timotheus to the Corinthian church to bring into remembrance the things that Paul had taught. And you see, sometimes you'll have different preachers stand behind this pulpit, and those different preachers will preach the same thing. That's fine. Hey, that's like my Timotheus preaching the things that, that, you know, to bring to remembrance the things that I've taught before, the things that we've learned in the Bible before. And we spoke about how it's God who brings us to understand the Scriptures. Remember the very first verse that we looked at. And I'm going to read to you now from John 14, 26. It says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. You see, Jesus Christ has sent the Holy Ghost to live in us, to indwell us, to bring to remembrance the things that Jesus Christ has taught us. You see, even within the Trinity, even within the Godhead, the Holy Ghost job is there to bring to remembrance the things that we've learned in the Scriptures, to help understand the Scriptures. And you guys are in Psalm 62, verse 11. And I, I like this one. I like this one a lot because it says here in Psalm 62, verse 11, 
God have spoken once. Now let me just say to you very quickly, where has God spoken once? Right here. Right here in the Scriptures. Right here in the Word of God. Hey, all six, six books of the Bible are the Word of God. You know, He moved men to, to pen down these words. God is the author of the Bible. You know, it says here that, you know, God have spoken once in Psalm 62, 11. And then it says, twice have I heard this, that, pow that power belongeth unto God. You see, the psalmist here is ready to recognize, yes, that the scriptures are written once, but he's heard it twice. What did he hear twice? That power belongeth unto God. You see, th this psalmist has heard preaching more than once on, on what God has spoken uh, once. And so you see, even in the Old Testament days, you know, you needed to hear things twice in order for you to, you know, fully understand, fully appreciate what God had already spoken the once. All right, so you can go back to Luke 24, please, verse 9. Luke 24, verse 9. I hope you understand the importance of rep repetition to bring things to your remembrance. And if you find yourself getting bored in church, getting bored to the preaching, it's the flesh. Okay, the spirit, the spirit, the new man wants to hear things again and again and, 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 and come to a greater understanding of the doctrines. Verse 9, And returned from the sepulchre, the ladies returned from the sepulchre, and told all things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. You see, and I, I brought, Brother Sam mentioned this in his 10-minute uh, sermon the other day, you know. The Lord has an important role even for women. Yes, many times, you know, the, the men are focused upon in the Bible. And yes, you know, men are called to be preachers and pastors and these things. But you see, even these ladies, you know, uh, uh, you know Mary Magdalene, uh, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, you know, and there are other, there are other ladies there that were there. You know, these angels gave them an important task to go and proclaim the fact that Jesus Christ had raised from the dead. You see, it's not only the job of a man to preach the gospel. What's the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of, of Christ. But it's the job of everybody. You know, men, women, children. We can all, you know, fulfill this, this task that God has given us to preach the gospel. And then uh, verse, number, verse number 11 and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. See, even the disciples, even the disciples did not believe the words of this woman, that Jesus Christ had been risen from the dead. Verse number 12. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Now, please, I'm, it is a Bible study today, guys. Keep your hand there. Go to John chapter 20. Because I, I love the words of John 20 here. I think it's so relevant, so important. John chapter 20, verse 7. John chapter 20, verse 7. So we just had a look at Peter going to the sepulchre and seeing these linen clothes laying by themselves. But do you think these linen clothes were, were a mess? You know, Jesus Christ coming out of the, this, this burial clothing, do you think Jesus Christ is the type of person that would just leave his bed unmade, as it were? All right, let's have a look there in John chapter 20, verse 7. It says here, And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself, then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. Now, I love that about our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he, he rises from the dead and he's not in any rush. You know, it, it's all done in the perfect timing of God. Not in any rush. You know, there, there was one cloth that was around his head, another cloth of, of you know, linen that was about his body. And he unwraps that one that's around the, the napkin that it's called here, around his head, and he just folds it nicely, leaves it to his side. You know, he makes his bed. He's not in a rush. He's organized. And I just love that about our Savior. You know, that none of this is a surprise to him. You know, he does things orderly. You know, he makes sure his bed is done, you know, if you want to put it that way. And children, let me say to you how important it is when you wake up in the morning to make your beds. It's a good example that we see Jesus Christ do himself. And actually, I should say the adults is because I don't really make my bed. My wife does. But, you know, I, th I think I should probably put a little bit more effort into that myself sometimes. All right. But we see the great example of Jesus Christ, just how orderly he is. 
and in not any in any mad rush. If you guys can go back to Luke 24 now, verse 13. Luke 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. Now, so it's interesting, two disciples, they're not, they're not the 12 or they're not the 11, as it, uh, t- you know, now because Judas had committed suicide. But um, these are two other disciples, and they're just walking along, talking about all the things that happened to Jesus Christ. And what I love about this here in verse number 15, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And that brings to my remembrance, you know, Matthew 18 verse 20 that says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And it's a beautiful thing that these two disciples are speaking of Christ. You know, all the things that took place. You know, Jesus Christ sees that and goes, you know what? I'm going to go and be in their presence. I'm going to go in the midst of them and walk with them. And, you know, again, that just brings to my remembrance once again. Hey, where there's more than two, two of us gathered here together, there's more than three of us here gathered together. And we're here gathered for his name, aren't we? You know what that tells me? That Jesus Christ is in the midst of us right now. That the presence of God is right here. You know, it's, you, you don't just come to listen to a preacher, to listen to a pastor, you know, but we're here to serve and be in the house of God. You know, the church is called the house of God for a reason. What kind of house would it be if God's not even there? You know? No, the house of God is, is and I'm not, not talking about the physical building, I'm talking about the people, you know, where two or three are gathered together. Hey, we were gathered together uh, yesterday, you know, by the beachside, you know, for the wedding. Hey, that was done in the name of, of the Lord as well. And you know what? The Lord was there. His presence was there as well in, in the midst of us. You know? So don't take church for granted because this is where you can come and, and spend time with the Lord as well. Verse number 16. It says, But their eyes were holden that they should not know Him. Now if you're not sure what that word holden means, it's, obviously we don't use uh, the English in that same way, but it's just a past tense of um, hold. So it's like held. So it's like saying their eyes were held back from, 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 from knowing that this was Jesus Christ. You know, I'm a, I'm, my assumption here is that this was a spiritual act by Christ himself to withhold them from seeing that he is Christ at this point in time. Verse number 17. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another, as ye walk and are sad? And again, I love this about Jesus. Because he comes to them, he doesn't just show them, hey, I'm the resurrected Christ. You know, hey, look, I'm, I'm risen from the dead. I'll answer all your questions. Jesus Christ is interested to know what they're talking about. He's interested and he asks them questions. You'll see Christ asking them questions as we go through this. He really wants to know what's on the hearts and the minds of his disciples here. You know, he could have just easily revealed the truth, but he wants them to think. He wants them to come to the full realization themselves that Christ had raised from the dead. Verse 18, And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Don't you know what's going on? Hey, this is Jesus they're speaking to. And of course Jesus knows what's going on. Verse 19, And he said unto them, What things? <laughs> So you see, Jesus Christ definitely just wants to hear them speak, wants them to come to understand, you know, what, you know, the, the, the full gospel message of Christ. It's not just his death. What things, he says. And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and, and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel, and beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. So you see, these guys are sorry, they're sad, they're cast down. Saying they crucified Christ. We're expecting Him to, to redeem Israel. We're ex- expecting Him to, to establish His kingdom, to overthrow the Roman Empire. You know, to, to, to establish His kingdom here on this earth. And then uh, verse number... Sorry, what am I up to, guys? 22. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. So they've heard the story of these women. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels. There's a confirmation that those men in in shining clothing were angels, which said that he was alive. 
And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the women had said. That was Peter and, and John was with him as well. Uh, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, this is Jesus saying to these two, O fools, and slow to ha of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You see, Christ calls them fools. Okay. Now, obviously, he loves them. Obviously, he knows them. Obviously, he's, they're his disciples. But why does he call them fools? Does he call them fools because they're sad? You know, does, that, does he call them fools? No, the reason he calls them fools is because they did not understand the scriptures. You know, Moses and the prophets had risen, had, sorry, had written not only about Christ, but they had written about his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why he calls them foolish. Hey, you've got the scriptures. The scriptures tell you all about what's going to happen. But they, they had not yet fully understood what he was referring to there. That's why he calls them fools. Hey, let, let me say to you, we have the Bible in our hands. We've got the Word of God in our hands. And if you don't read it, I'll just say this, you're a fool. Okay, we've been given the great wisdom of God in the, the, in the scriptures. You know, we need to make sure we take time to read it, to study it, to meditate upon it, to memorize it, to do it. Okay, and when you apply all these things, hey, your wisdom will increase. I don't want to be called foolish by God, you know, and yet, you know, that's what he says to, to these people. And he loves them. Okay, he loves them. Of, of course, he loves them. And then uh, uh, verse number 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? He says, look, you should have known Christ was to suffer these things and to enter into his glory. Hey, that's not the end of Christ. He's got to be risen again and be seated at the right-hand side of the Father. Verse 27. Now, this is the greatest preaching, I think, that is never recorded in the Bible. Verse 27. And beginning at Moses. Now, obviously, that's the first five books of the Bible. And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What a, what a sermon. What a Bible study for Christ to go through all the Old Testament and show them how, where it talks about Christ being, being crucified and, and risen from the dead. And uh, this is why the Bible is written by the one author. You see, the Bible is Christ-centric. It's all about Christ. And let me encourage you. I know the Old Testament is tough to get through. I know the Old Testament is challenging. You know, I don't fully understand. You know, if I were to compare my knowledge of the New Testament and the Old Testament, by far my knowledge of the New Testament outweighs my knowledge of the Old Testament, okay? It, it does require work. It does require expounding uh, the Scriptures. But let me encourage you, if you're going through the, the, the Old Testament and you're struggling a little bit, maybe you're giving up a little bit on your Bible reading, you're like, I don't know what this is saying. Look, just, just, just carry on. Ask the Lord to open your understanding. And, and here's the key. As you read through the Old Testament, look for Christ. Hey, well, here's the key. Look for foreshadowing of the blood sacrifice. You know, look at the foreshadowing of death and, 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 and resurrection. And when you find those beautiful gems in the Bible, it makes it really cool. It makes it really interesting. And when you find them, you're like, God, thanks for showing me this. I can see Christ in this chapter. I can see Christ in these Old Testament scriptures. Verse 28. And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went, and... And as he made, as though he would have gone further. Um, and they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake and gave to them. Now, I like this about Christ. So you can see before they partake of the meal, what does he do? He blesses the meal. You know, it's important for us to, you know, before we partake of our, our meals, that we give our thanksgiving to God for His provision, that we bless the meal before we partake of that. We see, it once again, here an example of Christ that we can all apply to our lives. Verse 31, And their eyes were opened, and they knew Him, and He vanished out of their sight. <laughs> He vanished out of the sight. So now they realize, hey, this is Christ. You know, he's expanded the scriptures to them. And they've seen how Christ has blessed the bread and broken. This is Christ. They finally recognize it. It's, you know, it's like the scales have been lifted off their eyes. Now I'm not saying these men were obviously already saved. Okay, they were already saved. They just hadn't fully understood, you know, the, 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 the resurrection of Christ and how that was all going to play out. But their faith was already strongly 
placed on Christ. The salvation was already by grace through faith without the, the deeds of the law. Okay? Uh, but this is what's going to happen. It's a wonderful experience when you learn new things in the Bible. It's like all of a sudden, oh man, I see that now. And it's so clear. Okay? Because the Holy Ghost that indwells you will enlighten you, help you understand that truth. Verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us? While he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures. And I mentioned boredom at church, boredom of preaching. I mentioned that's your flesh. You know, the, 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 the natural man that doesn't like the word of God. But you see, when the scriptures are being opened up, when the scriptures are being read, when they're being preached, you see the new man, the, the heart will burn within you. It's going to resonate with that new man, isn't it? Okay, because it's a spiritual food for your soul. And you see the hearts are burning when they, yes, you know, it's amazing. These truths have, you know, they, they resonated with the spirit within me. And what I'm reminded of here, just, just quickly, you don't need to turn there. It's Jeremiah 20 verse 9, a familiar passage that says, uh, this is Jeremiah saying, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. So Jeremiah's at a point says, look, I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm, I'm over it. You know, he, he, he's, 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 he's cast down. But then he says, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. He says, look, that, that fire that burns in my heart, that burns in my bones. You know, even when I want to give up, I can't. You know, it's got to come out. I've got to speak the words of God. I, lo I love that. And uh, let's keep reading verse 33. Verse 33. And, uh, and they rose up the same hour and, and returned to Jerusalem. These are the two that Jesus spoke to. And found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. Now, uh, this might not make a lot of sense to you. Simon is Simon Peter. And we just read, he went into the sepulchre, did not find the body. But these two have come here, and not only have, do they witness that they've seen Christ, but he says there in verse 34, and have appeared to Simon. So Christ, it's, again, this is not something that's recorded for our, in the Bible, but Christ had also appeared to Simon Peter at this, by this stage. And we get further confirmation. I won't go through that. But I did preach on the resurrection of Christ, or the eyewitnesses of Christ. Um, I can't remember the title of that. So you can, if, you want, if you want to know, I can tell you later on. But we, I went through 1 Corinthians 15. And 1 Corinthians 15 confirms that he was seen of Christ, uh, that uh, Christ was seen of Peter prior to be seen of the eleven. Okay, so we just have, again, just the consistency of the Bible here uh, lined up perfectly. And then verse 35. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and are frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye, have, as ye see me have. So I feel like Christ sort of just has a chuckle at him. You know, why are you terrified? Of course they'd be terrified. You know, I mean, if, I, if you've seen someone rise from the dead, you know, you thought well, their life was over. It's going to scare you. You're going to think you've seen a spirit. But Christ is like, why? <laughs> you know? And, and uh, one great uh, fundamental doctrine of Christianity, by the way, is the bodily resurrection of Christ. Now, if you're familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses, they do not believe that Jesus Christ was, was resurrected bodily. They believe that his resurrection was just spiritual in nature. But it's just, it's so contra it's co contradictive to the words that Jesus just spoke here. What did he say again, verse 39? Behold, what does it mean? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, touch me, and see. He says, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones. Hey, what is Christ made up of here? Flesh and bones, as you see me have. So he says, look, this is not just a spirit. This is, a, this is my bodily resurrection. The body that's missing from the grave, that's missing from the sepulchre, here it is. It's the resurrected body of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. You know, and this is, this is a very important fundamental doctrine of Christianity. That's why we know Jehovah's Witnesses is just a false religion. You know, that it's a false cult. You know, well, not a false cult. It is a cult. Okay? Uh, but it, that it, it's false in its teachings. 
And you know, you must, if for, in order for you to be saved, you must acknowledge the bodily resurrection of Christ. You, you must believe that He rose again from the dead. You know, and that's, a, that's, that's just one of the problems that the Jehovah Witnesses have. They have many, many other problems. Let's keep reading verse 40. And when He had thus spoken, He showed, him, he showed them His hands and His feet. Say, why is that relevant? Because remember, Christ was crucified. So, you know, the, the nail prints would have been there in His hands and His feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? Have you got any food? Jesus asks. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of an honeycomb. The word broiled just means cooked, cooked at a high heat. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of, and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. It's almost like Christ just had to prove to them, Look, I can eat. You know, I can eat fish, I can eat some honeycomb. It's a bodily resurrection, okay? So you can see that he's even eating food. Christ still has the ability to eat. Verse 44, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, and all things must be fulfilled. You see, Christ is telling them, Look, these are the words that I spoke to you. Even he has to tell them, Look, yes, remember, repetition is important. Bring to your remembrance the things that I said to you. It says that all things must be fulfilled there in verse 44, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And if you're familiar with the book of the Psalms, the songs, there's a lot there about Christ, isn't there? There's a lot there. And he even tells them about the Psalms there. And then verse 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So it seems here that Christ once again goes through the scriptures and shows them how it's about it's all about himself. And I, I hope the other two, you know, Cleopas and, and his friend who got the teaching, I hope they're involved. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is about Christ. I hope they're participating in the teaching as well. Verse 46, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved, behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now, I want to stop here at verse 47. I shouldn't have to. Let, let's just read verse 47 again, just very slowly. What needs to be preached, guys? What do we need to preach as disciples, as believers in Christ? What do we need to preach? Verse 47. And that repentance. Hey, we ought to preach repentance and remission of sins. Hey, what's the remissions of sins? It's, it's ensuring that you are forgiven of sins. That, you know, the sins have been, have been uh, forgiven of you. That they've been totally remitted from your account. That it should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Hey, this is not a message just for the Jews. This is not just a message for Israel. This is a message among all nations. He's telling this to His disciples. This is the first time after His resurrection where Christ gives the Great Commission the need to go and preach the gospel to every kingdom. But one thing that I need you to understand here, that a lot of people mix this up. Now, verse 47, look at it once again. There are false teachers that will say this. They'll say, and that repentance um, of your sins should be preached. Okay? Now, is that what it says here? Now, let me just say this. I'll make this very clear. Do I believe you should repent of your sins? Absolutely. Absolutely. We should do our best to turn from our sins and live holy, righteous lives, okay? We should do our best to keep the commands of God, right? When you turn from your sins, you know, when, when you stop doing certain sins, what are you doing? You're keeping the works of the law, aren't you? You're keeping the commandments of God. Is that important? Absolutely. You know, th this book is pretty big. It's not just about salvation. There's a lot of laws and commands of God that's written in this book. So we can live holy lives. We can live lives that are uh, pleasing to the Lord. But that we can just appreciate our own lives. That we can live long, blessed lives by following the commands that God gives us. But let me ask you this. Is keeping the commands, is turning from sins a requirement of salvation? No. Because salvation is not by the works of the law. Okay? Salvation is, been, has been completely paid by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and He rose again. He had power and victory over death, 
hell and sins. All right? Now, let's understand this. What is being taught? What is, should we preach repentance for salvation? Absolutely. Okay? What is repentance? Well, you go and ask someone, what do you, what do you believe you must do to be saved? You know, how can you be sure you're going to heaven? You knock on someone's door, guys. What do they say? You know, nine out of ten times. Be a good person, they say, right? Keep the commandments, they'll say, right? Be baptized. Go to church, they'll say. You know, do one to others. Keep the golden rule, they'll say, right? I mean, that's the, guys, you know, you go door knocking. You know what people say at the door. That's what they say. So what do they need to repent from? What do they need to repent from? They need to repent from trusting in their good works. They need to repent from trusting in their ability to keep the commandments of God. They need to repent from trusting their church that was, you know, they think their church will save them. They, they need to repent from trusting that their baptisms and their sacraments or whatever it is will save them. They need to repent from trusting their false gods to save them. They need to repent from trusting the, the saints that they pray to, uh, uh, you know, to save them. They need to repent from those things. What are they repenting? They're repenting in their faith, right? Their faith is on the wrong things, right? Or they just, they're just non-believers. They need to repent then from their non-belief, they need to take their faith, not their works, their faith that's on other things, and place all their faith, all their trust, all their belief on Jesus Christ alone. That Jesus Christ has done all the work that's necessary for our salvation. How dare you think that you can contribute to that? No way. You, you've already, you're already a sinner. You can't keep the laws of God perfectly. That's why Christ had to come and die on the cross for us. Do I believe in repentance? Absolutely. But repentance correctly defined. All right? What are you repenting from? The change of your mind as to where your faith lies. Okay? Where it wasn't 100% on Christ before. Now it needs to be 100% on Christ alone. Not Christ in your church. No. Not Christ in your good works. No. You fail. No. 100% on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now look at verse 47 again. So we know we need to re preach repentance. We do that every week, don't we? As a church, we go out and knock doors. We do this every week. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Hey, how do we have remission of sins? Well, we know that Jesus Christ has paid for all our sins. Well, no, no, you've, you, again, the false teachers say, you've, you've got to turn. You've got to clean up your life. You've got to try to keep the commands. No, no, no. That's not how you get remission of sins. Please go. I'll get you to turn to... Let's go, go to Romans chapter 3, please. Romans chapter 3. And while you go to Romans 3, I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter 1, verse 76. Back to Luke chapter 1, verse 76. When uh, John the Baptist, remember, the forerunner to Christ, what was said of him? It says here in Luke 1, 76, And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. You see, in order for you to be saved, you must have remission of sins. So you've repented from your false beliefs or you repented from your non-belief, okay? And that needs to be transferred onto Christ. Now, you guys are in Romans 3. Actually, I'll read one more passage to you before we look at Romans 3. I'm going to read to you from uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Just so we have a few witnesses here. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. And this is what we read about with Christ going back to the Old Testament prophets, right? And expounding the scriptures, teaching how it was about himself. Acts 10, 43 says, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name, look at this, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. How do you receive remission of sins? By believing on Christ. By putting all your faith on Christ. You guys are in Luke, uh, sorry, Romans 3. Romans 3, 4, uh, 24. Romans 3, 24. Let's just solidify this with other passages. Romans 3, 24. The Bible says, being justified freely. Justified freely, guys. Guess what? Salvation is a free gift. It's been paid 100% by Jesus Christ. Hey, if you have to pay just a small amount, it's no longer free, is it? 
That's why it's, it, it, you cannot contribute to your own salvation. Justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness, look, for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, that this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. How are we justified? How do we receive remission of sins? By believing on Jesus. How do we believe on Jesus? We repent from our non-belief. We repent from the things we were trusting to go to heaven. And we put all our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. These things come together perfectly, beautifully. This is what we're called to preach. Okay? That's the gospel message. Then, we get, hopefully, they're saved, sealed forever by the blood of Christ. You know, uh, salvation, eternal life. Then the next step, try to get them baptized. Try to get into church. Why? To keep the commands of God. For salvation, no. Okay, so they can live holy, righteous lives and be pleasing to the Father. Let's go back to Luke 24, verse 48. And if you, look, if you have questions about this, please ask me after the service. You know, this is so important that we understand salvation. This is the most important doctrine that we have in the Bible. You know, I'd rather be wrong about everything but right on salvation than wrong on salvation and right about everything else. Okay? Uh, Luke 24, verse 48. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until, until ye be endured with power from on high. So what Christ is speaking about here is um, the power that would come from the Father here or from, you know, that they were to wait for was the power of the Holy Ghost. This is known as the day of Pentecost, okay? When his disciples were filled by the Holy Ghost and if you know the story, they were able to speak with tongues and by, by what I mean by that, in other languages, okay, other real life languages, you know, Spanish or, oh, well, Spanish wasn't a language back then, but other real languages, right? So they could preach the gospel. Now, this is very important because a lot of people misunderstand what the power of God is here, okay? They think that it's about healing the sick. They think it's about casting out devils. They think it's about doing some miracle work, okay? Many churches today think they're able to do miracles and that's the power that God has given them. But that's not the power that Christ is speaking about here, okay? Let's get proof of this. Keep your finger there. Go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's, it's repeated once again here in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says, this is Jesus speaking once again, but ye shall receive power, okay? So there's Christ confirming that these disciples are going to be empowered soon enough. That's on the day of Pentecost. Look at this. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The Great Commission being preached once again by Christ. Hey, what do we need the power of the Holy Ghost for? Did Jesus give us the power to perform miracles? No. What is the power of the Holy Spirit for? What did it say there? You know, we don't need to twist the scriptures. It's right there. Verse 8. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. Hey, the power of the Holy Ghost has been given to us so we can witness of Christ. So we can go and preach the gospel to the uttermost part of the world. That's why. You know, that those charlatans that are doing so-called miracles, saying they've got the power of the Holy Ghost? No, they don't. It's, it's make-believe. It's pretend, it's games. The power of the Holy Ghost is seen when someone is, has the ability to go and preach the gospel. Hey, seeing someone believe on Christ, calling upon the name of the Lord, getting saved, it's the greatest miracle that can take place. Okay, where a man was once destined to hell, to the lake of fire, but now his destination has been totally changed. They'll spend home forever in heaven, eternal life in Jesus Christ. It's an amazing miracle. That's, that's the miracle that's important, guys. That's the miracle that matters because it's a sad thing if your soul ends up in hell. It's a sad thing if your soul rejects Jesus Christ. No, it's, 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 it's a time to believe on Christ today. And to be sure, it's a free gift 
fully paid for in Christ. Okay, salvation, an amazing thing. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's keep reading. Verse 50, Luke 24, verse 50. We're almost done now, guys. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And by the way, this is when Christ is, uh, um, uh, ascends up into heaven into, by the cloud, if you remember that. Now, you, just in case you're wondering, most of us know that he, when, he, when he ascended up to heaven, it was on the Mount of Olives. But here in uh, verse number 50, it said, And he led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. So I'll quickly look this up because I was kind of interested. Where is Bethany in light of the Mount of Olives? Because other passages say he was, you know, it was the Mount of Olives. And just quickly, I'll just read from you Acts 1 verse 9. It says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So you see Christ was lifted up by these clouds. You know, God has given this ability to, to, be, to raise up into heaven by this cloud. But this took place at the Mount of Olives. And when you look up where Bethany is, um, it's on the southeast slope of the Mount of Olives. So it is the same location. It's just the southeast slope of the Mount of Olives. These kinds of things interest me. If that interests you, that's your reason why. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 52. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Hey, where did we start this chapter at? Sorrowing, weren't they? They were saddened. They were depressed. They lacked understanding. Where do we leave them off now when Christ is, is uh, resurrected to heaven? It says here they worshipped Christ. Right? What a beautiful thing. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Hey, they were rejoicing in the Lord. You know, that they were strengthened. You know, that they had clarity as to what the Scriptures were all about. They understood now the resurrection of Christ. They were full of joy. And hey, what do they do when they're full of joy? Verse 53. And were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. You see, there was a transition taking place here from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we know the Old Testament temple is called the house of God. And so they went to the temple to rejoice, to praise God, to worship Him. Okay? But the house of God in the New Testament, what is it once again, guys? It's the local church. Okay? And again, not this building, but the people. Hey, look, and if you, you can say to me, you know what, Pastor Kevin, I can rejoice in the Lord. I can rejoice in His resurrection. Then where should you be? You should be in the house of the Lord, right? Verse 53. And we're continually in the temple. Hey, you should be continually in the house of God. Hey, whenever the doors of church are open, you should be here. Now, of course, you know, there are going to be times when you can't because of sickness or other things. But, you know, it should be our habit. It should be, it shouldn't even be a question, do I go to church today? And it just should be, hey, we're going to church today. It's Sunday. You know, the doors are open. Let's be there. Midweek service. Hey, let's go. Church is up. We're going there. We're going, we're going to continually be in the house of the Lord, praising God and blessing God. So please, guys, I hope you take this on board for yourselves, that you make church an important priority, not for me, okay? Because why? Because Jesus Christ, when we're gathered in His name, two or three are gathered in His name, that He'll be in the midst of us. Hey, I want to be where Christ is. I want to be in His presence. Where's that going to be? It's going to be in the house of the Lord. It's going to be in the local church. Let's pray.